This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Well, good evening. Uh, another night here at the Mead House, and uh, I'm just telling the guys I'm not in the best of moods tonight. Uh, but we're going to try to suffer through this thing. I did something to my back uh, yesterday, and it's, you know it's one of those things where you know you you have this little feeling, this little twinge, little thing, and you know you know what's going to happen 24 hours from then. And, uh, you know, you get to that point where you just, you know, you can't roll out of bed and all that. Anyway, that, that's where I'm at tonight. So, um, hey, again, welcome to the Mead House. Hi, and uh, we, uh, we're going to continue on down this braggart path. Last week, uh, we had Michael Fairbrother on uh, from Moonlight Meadery. And, uh, wow, opened a lot of eyes, a lot of good information from Michael. And, uh, again, thanks uh, to Mike for appearing on the show with us. Um, but first off, you know, and again, I apologize. I, did, I didn't get out to Facebook. Uh, Chris and I were talking. Uh, he called yesterday. And we got to talking about chocolate, chocolate nibs, and what to do and, and how to how to use them and whatnot. And uh, so I spent a couple hours looking at all kinds of information about chocolate nibs and, you know, how they're used in beer brewing, mead making, and, and what have you. So we're going to be talking about that tonight. Uh, Ryan's got some uh, pretty good ideas on uh, a kind of a different method of either creating a beer wart or... Uh, a an addition to for a mead, uh, but we'll talk about that here in a little while and straighten that all out for you. Hey, the call in number tonight eight one eight nine two one four six four six eight zero. If you want to give us a holler, uh, we're located at the meadhouse dot com. That's where we live, and of course we do have the Facebook deal, which is picking up uh, quite a bit of traffic lately. And you simply just go to the Mead House on Facebook. Uh, the crew tonight, uh, Ryan Richardson in the house. Aaron Martin, he's off gallivanting around oh, Slovenia. or Where was it he was headed? I thought Switzerland. Switzerland, that's it. Uh, that's Mississippi. Oh, I'm jealous. What, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, you know, he's going to come back with a boatload of mead, too. Oh, you think? <laughs> <laughs> Mississippi. If he, can, if he can get it through customs, he's going to be loaded down. <laughs> and that's Mississippi. Chris Spencer right there. Jeff Schaus in the house. My name's J.D. Webb. And, boys, I've been drinking some today. Uh, well. What's in your cup? <laughs> yeah, what's in my cup? Well, I got an early start on my red wine. Now, it just goes back to my cardiologist uh, whose instructions to me was, that I must drink a glass of red wine a day, and that's that's what I've been doing. Uh, not that I've had a whole lot, but I'm drinking a Hecker Pass winery. It's called Red Velvet. It's a it's a blend, uh, very dry but very fruit forward. Uh, and uh, we tasted this. This is a uh, uh, this is a private vineyard. It's a private family. They bottle it right there at the uh, at the estate, and uh, really good stuff. Uh, he's an award-winning vintner. Uh, uh, came here from Italy. Uh, oh gosh, we're talking probably back in the 30s and 40s, uh, and uh, we kind of stumbled across uh, his uh, his winery on the way home from up north. Uh, here in California, and uh, stopped in, uh, had some sips of some uh, some of his wines, and we came home with several bottles of 
uh, of his wines. This one tonight, Red Velvet. Uh, this is from Hecker Pass Winery up in the Santa Clara Valley. So, uh, but uh, Ryan, what's in your cup tonight, bud? Well, I am uh, drinking a. It's a technically, I guess, it's a beer. It's kind of along. I was inspired to pick it up uh, along the lines of of the Braggit. Um It's called. You know, I got, I live in in the Northeast neighborhood. It's you know just called Northeast. Um, and this particular beer is called Northeast Nectar, and it's described as a honey Kolsch. And the description says that it is a, uh, you know, a pale, light-bodied ale, uh, clean and refreshing, you know, fermented clean, and then with copious amounts of honey added at the end of the batch. You know, it's supposed to give a little bit of a sweeter character. Um, it's a great beer. Uh, I'm not getting any honey out of it. I, I Maybe I went in thinking that I was uh, going to get more um, honey flavor, honey aroma. But I, I, it's it's just like drinking a real nice, uh, very nice, clean, light-bodied ale. Um, you know, it, it's got beautiful color, but I, I'm just not getting any honey out of it. Maybe as it uh, warms up a little bit, I'll, I'll get a little bit more. But again, I, I wanted to try that out, uh, being that it's it's not really a braggot, but it it it's at least along those lines of of where a brewery might go by adding some honey. There you go. Sounds interesting. Mississippi uh, is that dark Italian roast? I smell. <clears throat> not, uh, not. It will be in a little bit. <laughs> uh, I've got a. Uh, I've been on sort of a beer education this week. There um, you go. Because I really wanted to to make a good braggot, and I think it's ridiculous to think that you could make a good braggot if you can't make a good beer. So I've been trying to educate myself on it, and um, which is kind of boring. It's it's kind of like being forced to study English when you just want to be a football coach. Um, you know, but, uh, anyway, uh, I've got a Samuel Smith, uh, organic chocolate stout and, uh, exploring all the different dark styles. So I think that's probably where I'm going to end up going with, uh, with another braggot because, uh, I found out that I'm not a fan of extremely bitter beers. Uh, I tried an Imperial Stout that had a uh, IBU of uh, 75, I believe it was, way too much for me. And uh, this Irish Red Ale is going to have 65. So um, while it may be good for a lot of people, uh, I discovered that I'm not a hophead. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm probably going to be looking at something like a chocolate uh, milk stout or something like that to try to do a brag it with. So I'm trying this chocolate uh, chocolate stout. Pretty good. So you're getting uh, you're getting some chocolate out of it. I mean, oh man, this thing is is running over with chocolate. It's <laughs> uh, on the nose and on the flavor and everything. And and I'm uh, I'm almost inclined to believe that they used some sort of artificial chocolate flavoring in this even though it says it's it's all organic chocolate but my gosh i don't know how they would have gotten this much out of it but the good thing is i'm not that far off uh from having my cup of coffee because this has got a lot of coffee coming through so okay. um it's, Sounds it's good. real smooth mm-hmm. yeah and jeff uh what's in your cup tonight my friend well, since we're talking braggots, I decided to to give myself an early preview of my little Saison braggot project here. Um, it's been bottle carbonating for about three weeks, and uh, you know it it needs more bottle carbonation. It's hardly got any head on it whatsoever, um, but it's still pretty good. I, I've got a it's it's an interesting project in that it a lot of the the beer qualities are right up front. You get that hoppiness um, right on the uh, 
the the start along with some of that yeast character from the saison yeast and uh, the finish is really a dry mead finish rather than a beer finish so it's kind of an interesting progression as you taste it wow sounds good um you know while we're on the uh while we're while we're talking chocolate <laughs> Uh, Chris called me yesterday, and uh, we had a discussion about chocolate. And um, uh, you know, he's uh, he's going to be working on this chocolate uh, milk thing that uh, he wants to do for his braggot. So it, our discussion was about you know what I did with chocolate, and you know how how did I use it and whatnot. And, uh, you know, we were talking about the different ways of uh, dealing with the cocoa nibs themselves. And, uh, you know, his question was, you know, if I had, uh, well, I don't know, what was your question? Remind me. <laughs> I can't even Well, I wanted, to know how, I wanted to know how you had treated them. Uh, yeah, that's it. Secondary, how many you used, and, did, you know, were you detecting any significant chocolate? flavors coming yeah. through and I you know but, you know getting everybody's opinion on it yeah and uh, so today um, rather than go cruise around the Facebooks that I, I usually do before the show I spent up uh, uh, probably a couple hours uh, just googling cocoa nibs and beer cocoa nibs and wine cocoa nibs and this and that and the other roasting cocoa nibs here's the rundown folks uh, to roast or not to roast? That's the question. So here's what I found out. 350 degrees for 30 minutes. 300 degrees for 12 to 15 minutes. Or you can do 200 degrees for 15 minutes. 170 degrees for 10 minutes. 150 degrees for 5 minutes. Soak them in rum or vodka for 72 hours or up to 3 to 4 weeks. Plus, you can make a tincture with two ounces of cocoa nibs and six ounces of vodka for four days, strain, then freeze, then strain again. So, <laughs> there, there so doesn't words, seem to do whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah. there, just, there just doesn't seem to be a standard, you know, uh, out there for roasting cocoa nibs or what to do with them. And uh, I didn't spend a great deal of time looking when I, you know, was putting them, when I was using them in my braggot. And, uh, I mean, uh, in, in my uh, stout that I made for my wife. And, uh, you know, the first couple of that I came to was uh, something like 200 degrees for like 15 minutes. That's kind of what I did. Uh, and I guarantee you, after after about 10, 15 minutes, I mean, the house smelled like one big Hershey bar. Um, now, you could also do them, I, I did a small amount. Uh, now, the thing about roasting them is you've got to be very careful because they will burn easy. Uh, and um, uh, you're just looking for a little color. You're looking for a little color change. They're going to get a little bit darker. But the thing about roasting is you got to keep moving them around. Uh, you know, uh, if you're going to do them in the oven, uh, let them sit in there for five or six minutes, take them out, stir them around, put them back in again, keep moving them around. You got to keep turning them. Uh, the ones I did in a frying pan, uh, you can do it on a, on a non stick. Don't do it in a cast iron, but do it in a non stick uh, uh, frying pan. But you got to keep the pan moving over a, over a medium heat. Uh, and again, you're just, you know, you're, you're, what I noticed is the color change. They get a little bit darker and it starts smelling like chocolate. I mean, there's no mistaking. Um, Chris, you came up with, uh, yeah, you know, another method using the, the vodka thing. And, uh, the last yeah, we, I, last we discussed, that's, you were going to do that, right? Well, yeah. See, I didn't want to jump in and try to do this on my own, so I I went to uh, went the route of the Northern Brewer uh, chocolate milk stout kit, mm -hmm. and in in the uh, comments on that, uh, I noticed that people who who followed the directions exactly with the chocolate said that 
they weren't getting a lot of chocolate. Uh, it was almost unnoticeable. Uh, and then I read where most people were saying that you need to go ahead and put your four ounces of cocoa nibs in vodka, uh, just enough vodka to cover them uh, when you start your primary. And by the time you get ready for your secondary, uh, you just dump the the whole thing in secondary and rack onto it. Uh, and the people who who did that said that they were getting a lot more chocolate coming through. Um, and some people even went so far as to add a, an extra couple of ounces uh, for even a much stronger chocolate. So I knew by reading that that something had to be done to the nibs um, to, to maximize the flavor. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to create a chocolate drink. I just want to, uh, but I, I want a little bit more than a hint. Uh, you know me, right. I don't like to have to search for flavors. I like to, I like for most flavors to be prominent, uh, at least enough so that you don't have to sit there and wonder, is that what I'm tasting? So um, uh, that's why I called you to see what you did to yours, because I know that some people roast the nibs and some people soak them. So, Um, I think what I'm going to do for this first batch is I'm going to soak them in, in the vodka and try it because this first batch is going to be simply a stout. There's not going to be any honey in it. Um, and that'll give me an idea of how much chocolate's coming through. If it's enough, I'm going to stick with it when I do the brag it. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's what I arrived at, and I and I think sometime in the future, uh, I probably will try um, try toasting them. But see, my my previous experience with using chocolate has been uh, Dutch processed cocoa, which was a powder. It was not nibs, mm-hmm. and and I know for a fact that that you can get some really good chocolate flavor from that and it's not harsh because it's been Dutch processed. So yeah. this is this is a new thing for me. This whole braggot thing in general is new and uh so I think I'm just gonna stick with the, the instructions and the general recommendations that everybody seems to be doing for the first go and and uh you know, I mean when we started this program we gave out the advice for new mead makers uh, you know, find a good recipe that's proven and, and don't change it. Uh, so I think we should probably, I should take my own advice on this and do it by the recipe the first time and yeah. then make changes afterwards. Um, Ryan, Jeff, have you two, uh, have, have you had an opportunity to use the cocoa nibs at all? And if you did, how, how did you treat them? Well, I I took some cocoa nibs and I put them in a mason jar and I filled it up with uh, high proof clear alcohol and I let it sit for about six months or so and then I strained it through a coffee filter and I use it as a chocolate extract in baking. And that's about my extent of my now of use of uh, cocoa nibs. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> okay. And you got, uh, I mean, what's the chocolate flavor that you got? Out of it? Is it pretty prominent? I mean, did it work? You know, the co- oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, my wife was, we were looking for something to give a little more, something a little special when you're, when you're making a chocolate cake or a chocolate cookie or something that would just, just be that that little something that you might not be able to put your finger on but but would make it pop a little more and and that definitely did it i you know the cocoa nibs don't have the ones that i use the they they have uh really no sugar in them so i mean if you if you wanted it what we're used to as a chocolatey flavor i think you'd have to uh mix in some butter and some sugar you know, to get, you know, the chocolate taste that we're used to out of it. I'm personally a dark chocolate guy. I mean, I, I like, you know, that 70, 80, 90 percent 
you know, cocoa when I, when I get a nice, good, dark chocolate bar. But, um, uh, but I mean, even, even this is, you know, it's more along, it would be more along the lines of like, and if you were just to pop a few in your mouth, probably like an, uh, an unsweetened, you know, Baker's, mm-hmm. you know, cocoa. Yeah, no, don't, you know, it's the same thing like hops. You don't want to do a mouthful of cocoa no. goods. <laughs> They're not going to taste good, I guarantee it. I've already been there and done that. <laughs> so, uh, well, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting uh, the way you're using it uh, in baking. Uh, have you ever given any thought to throwing it in a mead or a beer, or have, have you come to that uh uh, you know, for that, yeah. I I've been real hesitant to do that. Um, I I've had some. Now, my experience has probably been tainted, but I I've had a. It was some sort of a raspberry chocolate, um, you know, raspberry chocolate wine. I'm using air quotes as I say that. Um, you know, dessert wine, and it was um just you know i mean extremely strong extremely sweet extremely you know yeah. extreme and so i uh now i know that you know chris as you pointed out i mean you in the beginning you can use cocoa powder just purely as a source of tannin you know or or something like that you know not even get any chocolate flavor out of it but uh it, it has not been a path that uh that I've gone down yet um but you know i at some point i i very well might yeah you're not yeah. gonna like my meads, I can tell you that <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> you know, everything I do is extreme. I go overboard um <laughs> it's a habit that I have, and I think it has a lot to do with my uh, my ability to taste. Um, I think I've said before, I, I have like the worst seasonal allergies in the world, except my season runs 365 days a year. So, and, um, and Chris, I'm sure that I, I'm sure I'll enjoy some of your stuff. This, this raspberry chocolate wine I tasted was basically like if you took that, uh, you know, a raspberry Sunday topping, you know, they're sweet, uh, gooey type stuff. And yeah. you, you had that plus some, some chocolate syrup and you put those two things in a bottle and, and, uh, you know, called it wine. Oh, wow. I would do that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I would do that. <laughs> uh, no, Jeff, I, I just, uh, uh, that's, that's why I drink dark roast coffee, you know, because, I, I generally have to have fairly intense flavors in order to really perceive them well, whereas other people may not need something that intense. But since I make things to please myself, then that's how most of my stuff turns out. So um, yeah. you'll, you'll hardly ever, very seldom will you ever see me put a hint of something in anything Jeff, have you had uh, uh, any opportunity to work with Coco Nibs at all? You know, I've not. I've they're they're on my list. They're just not terribly high up on it. I'm uh, I, I'm kind of in Ryan's camp where if I'm going to have some chocolate, it's going to be a dark chocolate, and yeah. I I really it it's just not one of my favorite things. Um, moreover, it, it's not one of my wife's favorite things, so it's not something I can use to bribe her with. Um. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, you know, realistically, it's just one of those things I've meant to be tried, but uh, haven't gotten around to. You know, I probably will at some point. I just haven't yet. Well, I'm kind of with Ryan, too, on the dark chocolate. In fact, you know, that was another thing that my cardiologist told me, eat dark chocolate. So, uh, not that we eat a lot of it here, but I'm, I'm not a candy eater, never have been. So when it comes to, you know, candy bars, chocolate bars, that kind of thing, uh, I prefer the darker chocolates because they're they're not as sweet as the milk chocolates are um and i just like that rough kind of flavor and that's that's kind of what you get so you, you can't mistake these for you know for for uh, anything even remotely cl- 
close to a candy bar. I mean, that, that's not what these cocoa nibs are. They're going to give you that roasty chocolate flavor. Uh, you know. And see, for I mean, me, that's where the milk stout comes in. Um, yeah. To smooth that out. See, I like bold flavors, but I like them to be smooth. I don't want them to be harsh. So I choose a very dark roast coffee that's that's and brew it very strong, but then I add heavy cream to it to make it smooth. Yeah. And so so even though you know something can be bold without being harsh. And that's well, what that, I'm that's, after. So. Yeah, and that's what you I mean, you know, uh, and I think because of that, you're probably going to go the lactose route uh, to get some extra sugar in there without it fermenting away, and uh, yeah, or you yeah, know, or even back sweetening. Is, yeah, the lactose is going to be the uh, the milk part of the stout, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to be getting, uh, you know, if I do this, uh, to my understanding, I'm going to be getting probably some chocolate from from the specialty grains, um, probably as much as I will from the cocoa nibs, if not more, and uh, probably going to get some coffee, uh, coffee flavors from it. And, uh, uh, you know, like I said, I, I've spent this week uh, all my spare time trying to educate myself on how these different grains and things affect, uh, you know, like uh, adding wheat and things for head retention or for extra body or whatever. Yeah. And uh, trying to learn a little bit of, uh, of what I'm doing so I'm not just going at it blindly. But uh, it, it's it's really difficult to uh, to get into something like that when you, uh, when you don't have a great interest in it, which is why this whole thing with this little uh, apple cider <laughs> project is that's how it came along when my mind started wandering. So yeah. I'll tell you about that a little bit later. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I mean, this whole, I really, uh, I don't know. I wasn't all that excited about the cocoa thing, the chocolate thing. Um, my only, uh, my only real, I mean, I, I'm not interested in, in making anything that's chocolate flavored. I, I don't want a chocolate flavored mead. I, 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 I had, there, there's this stuff they call adult chocolate milk in a liquor store. And we came home with a, with a bottle of that one day, and that's the most foulest tasting stuff on the planet. Uh, it's just no good. I'm sorry. You just, you know, alcohol and chocolate just don't, you know, if it's a glass of wine with a, with a piece of dark chocolate, that's one thing. But uh, uh, I don't know that mead that uh, that Sergio sent us that the chocolate vanilla uh, that was I think if I remember correctly that was my favorite one of the whole batch he sent. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I really did like that. Uh, but there again, I would have probably doubled, if not tripled, the chocolate in it. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, the only reason why I'm working with the cocoa nibs is, I mean, this is for my wife's stout that I'm working on, this coffee stout. And I threw in some extra cocoa nibs, some extra vanilla beans. I put some, an extra pound of, uh, well, not an extra, I put a pound of lactose in it. Uh, and I, I I brought the ABV up a little bit with some brown sugar. And I, and I tasted it the other day, and it's, it's got a good flavor. Uh, in fact, we put it in the keg this afternoon, so uh, it's it's kegged up. It's uh, uh, not quite ready to drink yet. It's just gonna I'm gonna let it sit in the refrigerator for about a month uh, before we uh, put it through the tap. But that's the only reason why I was using it. Uh, you know, obviously my braggot is is doesn't have anything to do with chocolate at all, so uh, I really wasn't concerned about it, but. You know, I did want to, you know, come up with something, you know, that my wife enjoyed drinking, and she likes these chocolate coffee stout porters uh, and whatnot, and uh, so that that was my concern. And you know, like I said, when yeah, I when you I know, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say when I when I went out looking for, you know, okay, now that I got these, you know, I got two pounds. I ordered two pounds of cocoa nibs. 
uh, and so now what do I do with them? Okay, and then you, know, you you roast them what? So I went out and and search on Google and and you know like I said here's my list: 350 degrees for 30 minutes, 300 degrees for 12 minutes, 170 degrees for 10, so on and so forth. So what do you do? You know. <laughs> So I just took a I I just took some place in the middle. I think it was like 200 degrees, uh, you know, for about 15 minutes, and uh, you know it seemed to work. So, well, you know, judging from that need that that Sergio sent uh, with the chocolate vanilla, that was uh, he he went very from what I could tell from my taste, it was very light on the chocolate, but it added something to the mead without you know, getting all caught up in the chocolate flavor. Uh, so I'm thinking that, that chocolate may be a good, um, a little adjunct to to help emphasize other things, you know. So if you needed a little a, additional body or a mouthfeel or uh, tannins or whatever, uh, you could treat it the same way that we've talked about before with vanilla beans or bananas or whatever. Uh, you know, you can take a half of a ripe banana in a five-gallon batch of mead, and you can increase the, the body and mouthfeel without ever knowing there's a banana in it. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's probably those complex saccharides and things that are in there that are doing it. Um, but I, I think there's probably some possibilities there to help modify something without actually adding chocolate flavor. Yeah. Well, I, um, you know, and, and and that was that was just a basic. Other people out there that I found that are, you know, just dumping them right in at the end, in the last five minutes of the boil too. Uh, so, you know, and then there's another uh, group of people out there that don't do anything to them, but just put them in the secondary and let them float around. So. Uh, you know, I guess it runs the gamut. I mean, you know, do whatever whatever works for you. You know, uh, yeah. but I uh, I would say the opera in question I have here with with regards to like how you're handling that is uh, is it similar to to things like dark grains or to uh, to the coffee we visited in that coffee experiment where it would seem to me the takeaway I've gotten from both of those is that, you know, the higher heat you process those or the longer you process those on high heat, the more bitterness you get out of that as opposed to just a flavor. Whereas we saw like cold brewing the coffee got more coffee flavor and less bitterness. Uh, I think, I think Ryan had the same uh, observation with some of his grains too, that like cold steeping them, if you will, got a lot of that flavor out without the bitterness involved. So I wonder if that's if that's part of the uh, the idea behind some of these different approaches. You know, I don't know because uh, I did do some reading where uh, somebody had taken uh, uh, and roasted their 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 cocoa nibs and then uh, chewed on a couple of them, and his his uh, uh, he said they tasted sweet. Uh, he could detect uh, a level of sweetness. So. Uh, I can tell you that the ones that I chewed on weren't sweet. Now, you know, whether they were supposed to be or not, I couldn't tell you. Uh, but, I, you know, here again, I'm not looking for a sweet candy bar type chocolate effect. I'm looking for that, you know, what baker's chocolate contributes to a chocolate cake. I'm looking for chocolate, not, uh, you know, I'm looking for that cocoa taste, that cocoa bean taste not not a candy bar taste so uh, you know and I, and I think that's what I got uh, you know when I tasted that that stout today before we racked it that's what I'm tasting I'm, I'm tasting a kind of a dark chocolate flavor but it's not sweet at all I mean there, there's very 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 little if any sweetness to it at all. So it's it's not like eating a chop a chocolate bar. So, uh, but it certainly runs the gamut. Well, I mean, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm going to reserve judgment entirely until I finish this batch, and then I'll have a much better idea of of where I'm going with it. And and that's why I want to get some bottles out to you guys too when it's finished, uh, because I, I'm going to need 
input from different palettes to uh, sure. to see, you know, where it really stands. Because I, I, I'm not the most sensitive taster in the world, and uh, especially when it comes to more subtle things like that. So, um, then I'm also uh, not well versed in the craft beer industry either. So. Uh, well, that's uh, I, I, I did I did take four ounces of cocoa nibs, um, and I didn't roast them, didn't do anything to them. Uh, I put them in a uh, in a one pint mason jar. I just covered it. Uh, that's the recommendation. Just cover. You don't want to fill the mason jar up. Just cover the cocoa nibs with a vodka, and I I lidded it up and and uh, you know I'll check it in a couple of days and and see where we're at with it. Uh, you know, I, I kind of like that idea. Ryan's had some pretty good luck. I, I, I don't know about letting it sit for six months, but uh, did you do anything to the to the? You just dumped them in the jar, right, Ryan? You didn't cook them down or roast them or do anything to them, right? No, no. I bought uh, raw uh, raw cocoa nibs, you know, and then I put them in the jar, and and then every so often I, you know, open up the pantry and shake the jar. Just yeah. to keep everything moving around. That was it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, you know, Michael Fairbrother uh, was with us last week, and what a pleasure it was to have him on the show. Um, you know, gosh, a lot of useful information. I, I came away with that. But after the show was over with, I, I was sitting here, you know, actually during the show when he was talking you know, uh, we got into a pretty good discussion about making braggots. And if you recall, a couple a couple shows ago, we had talked about we going to treat this this braggot uh, thing that we were doing. You know, is it a, are we going to treat it like a mead, or are we going to treat it like a beer? Because there's a couple of different schools of thought out there on management, and um, I think I think a good number of us, if not all of us, decided, well, you know, it, it's a it's a mead style, so I'm going to treat it like a mead. That's how that's what I did. So I stirred the crap out of it <laughs> for the, you know, for the first four days, uh, and then to hear Michael Fairbrother say, no, don't stir it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was plenty worried, dude. <laughs> How did yeah. you guys? Uh, what were you guys? Uh, are you worried about it? Did you stir? Uh, where are you at with it? What do you think? Well, I fully intended to. I was going to stir it just like a mead, but I got busy with work and everything, and actually ended up neglecting it. And I guess it turned out to be uh, a good thing. Yeah. Ryan, uh... Yeah, you know, I was a little concerned, I'll admit that. Um, At the same time, you know, we have... My my braggot is is 50% honey, and I'm using, you know, some adjuncts. You know, I'm using toasted coconut, I'm using vanilla bean... You know, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, uh, caramelize that honey. Um, so uh, I didn't, I, I didn't stir it up. I didn't, you know, aerate the hell out of it. You know, I was mostly, I wasn't really breaking the surface all that much as, as just making sure that, that the yeast was moving around. So uh, the way I look at it is, uh, even, even if there was some very slight, oxidation of the malt that I was using and again I was using uh, chocolate malt and roasted barley and uh, you know dark dark malt extract that the adjuncts and all of the bold flavors that are in there from the coconut the vanilla and the uh, the caramelized honey are going to cover a little bit of that oxidation and if anything that oxidation might actually, um, if it if it hits the form of a sherry like flavor, might actually uh, enhance the braggot. 
um, in the finished product. And again, I'm, I plan on aging this out for quite a while. And, uh, so we'll see how that age generally helps at least me. It's now, um, I'm also very good at circular reasoning. So all of this might just be put me at peace of mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, sounds good. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can follow my rule. If if I ever have something that, that starts to oxidize, I just throw in some uh, dried cherries. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. If it starts to oxidize, throw in some cherries, and and it tastes like you meant to do it. There you go. <laughs> well, I was thinking with this, the uh, the old brewers, you know, kind of half joke is, if you don't like the way it turned out, you just dry hop it and cover it with hop flavor. <laughs> and, and so, you know, with with this being a beer style, I, I get that's that's my backup if. If uh, it, before we lose a five gallon batch, let's just hop the hell out of it and, and use that. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, gosh, I wish I wish Aaron was here. He'd go along with that too. I bet he I'm likes sure that he hopped up stuff. Uh, Jeff, what, what what was your take on that whole uh, thing? Michael was talking about the stirring, not stirring thing. What what's your uh, well, you know, this is my second time through doing a braggot, and I was, I'm a little bit concerned, and I'm probably going to revisit it in future batches, but realistically, compared to a regular mead, um, I didn't stir it as much, mainly because I found, like, getting the uh, the drill in there and getting it going, the, the graininess of it, uh, it really whipped up a frothy head, or I don't know about a head, but like, well, Krausen, yeah. I forget the term for that, and really discouraged me from doing too much of that. Um, so I, I think that might have been a saving grace for me. It made it, my my own laziness might have helped me out there a little bit in that regard, or just not wanting to deal with that mess. Um, so yeah, I, I might not do that at all in the future. I might uh, I might uh, still do the same thing. That's probably something I need to to test a little bit. Um, well, Let's see if it makes a difference. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I, still under the impression that that things need to be moved around, though, and especially yeah, when you're too. starting with with that much gravity and that much honey, uh, and those yeast are not. If you're using a beer yeast, they're not going to be optimized to uh, to the honey anyway. So they're going to need all the help they can get, and and I think that there's a you know a general way of moving things around without introducing oxygen, um, yeah. just just to keep things moving and and try to get the best attenuation you can from it. That's why well, that's yeah. with the, with the beer that I did with, with with the two beers that I've done so far, I just. I, I, my my half inch drill. It's a you know battery deal. It's a variable speed, and I I put my stirrer on, and uh, with the beer, I just turn it enough. I don't even make a whirlpool. I just spin it enough just to agitate it a little bit to get the yeast moving, uh, and then I stop. I mean, we're talking you know maybe ten seconds. Uh, of a gentle stir, and I, 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 I try not to disturb the surface at all with it. So, uh, you know, uh, but because I, I do believe in keeping the yeast suspended and, and all of that good stuff. So, uh, but on my meads, uh, I mean, I'll stir the crap out of it, and uh, you know, uh, get a good head of CO2 working out of that thing. Uh, but you know the braggot thing, um, you know, like we discussed on that on that one show a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I, you know, uh, as far as I was concerned, it's a style of mead, so I'm going to treat it just like a mead. Uh, and I fed it. Uh, I, uh, you know, uh, I don't have my book in front of me. I, you know, I, I need to start putting a book on a desk here, but. I think it was Fermade O or no Fermade K is I think I would. What did I tell you? Chris, for my, I, I used DAP once in the beginning, and I, then I used I think Fermade you said K. Fermade K. Yeah, yeah Fermade, Fermade K, K is what I used. Yeah, for, I used Fermade yeah. K, and I only used DAP in the beginning, and then no DAP uh, 
in, on uh, number two, three, and four. Um, and it, you know, it right now it tastes fine. It's got this. This is that bourbon barrel uh, braggot that we're doing here. And uh, I use the I use 16 ounces, actually a little bit more than 16 ounces of bourbon because I had soaked the oak cubes in about two ounces of bourbon, uh, and I dumped it all in. Uh, so we're probably looking at oh, maybe 15 and a half, or I mean uh, 16 and a half, 17, 18 ounces somewhere in there uh, when it all comes to it. Uh, but it's got a it's got a really nice bourbon flavor right now. Not so much the oak flavor yet. Uh, I'm, that's you know still young yet, so I'm waiting for that to come around. Um, and it's not hot; it's not alcoholic hot, uh, which is a good thing. It was fermented at 66 degrees. Um, but uh, like Ryan, I'm I'm going to let the thing sit. I'm I'm not in any big hurry. Uh, so uh, you know, I intend on giving it at least maybe four months at least that uh, well you know jd uh, we we've promised our listeners from day one that that we would only put out uh either information that was proven that we knew worked or we would let them know that we're trying it out and we'll throw the honey out for you as we yep. said early on and we may end up throwing some out in this go around but um uh, you know this style, this this braggot deal. Uh, if you could go back 150 or 200 years in uh, Great Britain or or Ireland or Scotland, you would find braggots everywhere. Um, even up to like up to the not early 1900s. Um, but this has been pretty much out of out of the brewer's language for a very, very long time, and it's almost like trying to rediscover it, uh, almost yeah. reinventing it. And uh, so uh, unless there are some very, very old breweries left over in Europe that never stopped making it in the first place, uh, we're pretty much left to uh, to reinvent it. So yeah. I, I kind of look at it that way. I, I don't think that I don't really feel like I've got any set rules that I've got to follow. I've just got to create something that that is representative of mead and of the beer style, uh, and it works well together, and I like it. So that's yeah. really the only rules I'm trying to follow here. Are you pounding on my leather? I have. <laughs> I, I've, uh, I've, I'm drawing your pattern, actually. <laughs> I can hear the hammer. <laughs> uh, no, I was I was drawing your pattern. You probably heard the eraser. I, I heard something banging in the background. <laughs> um, no, there's no banging here. Oh. Um. Well, all right. So, uh, but you're onto something else there uh, in the uh, old. Well, you're not in Mississippi. Where are you? Well, I guess you are. You yeah, see, I'm in Mississippi. Uh, yeah, well, let's call it Corinth, Mississippi. Yeah, you got something else no, going I'm on down there. I'm not in Corinth. I'm from Corinth. I'm not in Corinth. Ah, okay. <laughs> let's just call um, it Mississippi. You got something else going on down there uh, in the yeah. cider world, don't you? I do. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, I was uh, reading about all these different malts and and beer additions, and and my mind started to wonder, and I started thinking about making a hard cider, and you know the the um, discussion we had about the apples that we have available to us, and uh, that we don't have the greatest variety, <clears throat> and uh, so I started thinking, how can I make up for some of the things that are lacking? in the apples that we have. And yeah. that's primarily um, um, bitter apples, for one. And uh, it seems like that a lot of the cider that I've tried to make turns out really, really thin-bodied. And, and I mean, yeah. a, cider, a cider should be thin. A cider should be light, but it shouldn't be heavy. But I don't want it to be so watery. So I That's my thinking, trouble, too. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking, how how can I fix this? And some of the stuff I was reading about the beer, um, uh, adding body and, um, uh, and, and of course then hops or uh, bittering and everything. I didn't want to make a, a beer cider mix. I didn't want anything like that. I wanted to make a pure cider, but just use just enough to augment it. So I was thinking, okay, I can make up for a lack of bitter apples uh, with with some small additions of hops, and I can uh, maybe use some something like some crystal uh, one twenty or something to uh, add a little bit more body to it, but keep the amounts very very low, very small. Do like a maybe a two or three quart uh steep or a bowl with these and uh and then the rest is apple juice and I've made up the difference and uh so you know I, the more I thought about it and I ran it through the calculator and everything worked out perfect and uh the the addition of using the crystal malt solved the problem of having to use sugar because I was getting enough jump in gravity from that that it solved the whole problem. And I'm thinking, okay, I, I mean, I already started writing my speech for the American Home Brewers Association <laughs> Hall of Fame induction, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm, I'm really proud of myself. I've come up with something just perfect here. Then this is, this is going to work. So I get online to start searching around to see what hops and things might go good with apple flavor. And lo and behold, I find out that I haven't invented anything. People have been doing this for years. <laughs> uh, in fact, the the uh, experimental recipe idea that I wrote down was exactly the one that everybody's been doing for at least six or seven years. Oh, and there's this <laughs> there's this huge thread on homebrew talk uh, started by a guy named Brandon O. Uh, and it's it's called a graph, and it came from a Stephen King novel. It was a fictional drink that Stephen King wrote about in this book, The Dark Tower, and he called it a graph. And it was a uh, it was a cider that had a small little bit of malt and hops in it to make it taste like a good cider. And so. Uh, you know, my excitement was dashed a little bit, but the good thing is everybody that did it absolutely loved the results. So I immediately ordered all the ingredients to do it. And, uh, you know, the downside is I don't get my um, homebrewers award, but the <laughs> upside is everybody's already done it and worked out the kinks. So <laughs> it'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to share that. No, really, I, I really wanted to share that because uh, that that may be, uh, and I haven't made it yet. It's going in the fermenter tomorrow, actually. Um, what, uh, but that, that may be a perfect answer to all the the problems that we have here in America with making a good cider. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, because. Uh... You know, I had my second bottle of cider uh, here just you know last week, uh, and uh, and I mean, and it's an English cider. I, mean, I love the English ciders because they're just so they're just so right on, uh, you know. And I've tried I've tried all the Angry Orchards and and everything, and I just I just it's more like soda pop for me, and I just don't care for them, but. Uh, these English ciders, uh, they're on to something. I mean, that's that's like the real deal. Yeah. To, to, so anyway, you know, this is, uh, in, anyone who wants to make this, just go uh, Google uh, a graph. It's G-R-A-F or G-R-A-F-F uh, recipe. Uh, and it's started by Brandon O on Homebrew Talk. And Real simple, easy to follow. It's only like, um, let's see, one, two, I think it's only like three ingredients that go in, three or four. 
So you're just using store bought apple juice? Yep, yep. Just, just like uh, now, the one thing that I I did take away from it is uh, if you can find apple juice that has no vitamin C added, you'll be able to drink it and enjoy it a lot faster. Uh, the vitamin C or or ascorbic acid is going to add some some tartness to it that takes a while to uh, to kind of mellow out and blend. Um, I was lucky enough to find some some store bought apple juice that that didn't have anything at all in it. Um, the only downside is that it's from concentrate, which I would rather not have had, but. Uh, I'm going to be solving that problem pretty soon because I'm I'm going to be working on my uh, my cider press, so I'm going to I'm going to solve that problem. But this yeah. first batch is going in tomorrow, and it's uh, it's like a pound of um, I think it's a pound of amber DME, a pound of light DME, um, a half a pound of Crystal 120, uh, and like a half an ounce of um, of some sort of hops that are around six uh, percent alpha acids, and so you you boil this up in in three quarts of water for thirty minutes, and then you you um, sparge your um, your crystal with uh, a quart, another quart of water, boil it for 30 minutes, and so that creates about a gallon. And then you make it up to five or a little over five gallons with your apple juice, and um, he suggests using Nottingham to ferment it, or Cephal, um, Cephal uh, SO4. Yeah. Um, and, and I, you know, that's sort of keeping in line with the, with an English style cider so yeah i'm going to use nottingham on this and uh uh then you um you, you leave it in primary for about two weeks you can secondary it for about two weeks and then you uh, bottle condition it with um three quarters of a cup of of dextrose and pretty straightforward that's that's about it so yeah I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I really thought I had come Sounds up good. with something great, but uh, somebody beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll put the award back up on the shelf for another day then. Uh, I'll come up with something else. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Uh, <laughs> that does sound good. Uh, you know, uh, and I, I like the way I've done ciders. Uh, in fact, I've got one going right now. It's just, you know, regular old, I don't remember the brand, whatever the brand is, uh, store-bought cider, uh, you know, that clear apple juice, uh, chemical-free and all that kind of good stuff. And I use Nottingham. I put uh, like a pound of sugar in it, brown sugar, and I use Nottingham. And uh, it pretty much goes, it goes pretty dry. I mean, there's hardly any sweetness in it, but... You know, like I say, it, it's 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 good when it's done, but it's like really watery. It's just that thin. You know, uh, mm-hmm. it, it needs something else, and I'm I really don't want to put a whole bunch of you know I don't want to drop cinnamon sticks and and all this stuff, but I do kind of like that idea that Michael was talking about uh, Fair Brother on that last show about uh, a vanilla was a vanilla bean and cinnamon. And he said, that's all he does to his and he can't keep it, uh, in stock. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, his number one selling, selling need. Yeah. So, anyway, I'll report back on this when it's done. Uh, hopefully this will be ready by Christmas. Hey, Chris, sorry if I, uh, I missed it there. What kind of hops did you use again? Um, I'm using Fuggles. Um, okay. Now, the Fuggles are a little bit under 6%, but uh, the guy, the original poster there, he did mention that if you're going to adjust the hop level, always adjust downward because otherwise it's just going to be too much. It'll clash uh, and be too bitter. So um, I think 
there was somewhere in the thread that he did mention he he had had the best results with fuggles. Okay. Uh, so a ha- half an ounce of fuggles for for thirty minutes. You're only boiling the boiling it for thirty minutes anyway. So. Sure. A thirty uh, minutes thirty minutes steep and a thirty minute boil. I think I've got it right here. You you uh, five but you do the half a pound of crystal sixty L. Uh, yeah, he said you can on. use sixty L if you have um, if you have light colored uh, store bought apple juice. He recommends one twenty L. Yeah, but if you have if you have fresh pressed, which is naturally darker, then you can use sixty L. And uh, what is what is torfied wheat? <laughs> uh, it's basically just wheat that's been roasted, and and that's only added to uh, improve head retention, and and you only add an ounce of it. So you you put um, you put your crystal one twenty and your one ounce of torrified wheat in in a grain bag, and you steep it at one hundred and fifty five for thirty minutes yeah. in three quarts of water. Then you sparge that with another quart. So now you've got a one-gallon boil. You bring that to a boil. You mix in one pound of amber DME, one pound of light DME, and a half ounce of fuggles. Boil that for 30 minutes and put in your let it cool. Put in your apple juice. Uh, I'm I'm going to put in uh, pectic enzyme in that. Uh, I don't think that's in the recipe, but I'm not working with apple juice without some peptic enzyme because it'll never clear. Yeah. Um, well, if you're dealing with the craft, you know, the, the craft beer world, the haze is cool. Haze is what's in. Oh, really? Haze. Well. <laughs> oh, yeah. You'd be, you'd be. I mean, I, I kind of live in one of the hotbeds of craft breweries, and you'd be hard pressed to go to a craft brewery you know, and find a clear beer, uh, just about, you know, and I'm sure there's going to be people who are, you know, writing in, uh, telling me I'm wrong, but, uh, most of them right now are using the, uh, a lot of the strains are low, uh, uh, low flocculation and, and leave a lot of that, that haze, you know, behind in the, in the beer. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so don't think of it as as an imperfection. Think of it as trendy. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I'll my... find an excuse for whatever goes wrong. <laughs> my impression of an English cider is that it's supposed to be a little bit hazy, a little bit cloudy. Anyway, it's just kind of that. Uh, what do I want to say? It's it's like a rustic style, like kind of like what Ryan said. It's just it's a desirable trait. So, I don't think that's mm-hmm. necessarily a problem anyway. Well, you go back to go back to. uh, I don't think they had. I don't think they really cared about. uh, You know whether ciders were clear, whether beers were clear. You know back in the turn of the century, eighteen hundreds, seventeen hundreds, anyway. So uh, you know unless they put it through an old pair of socks or something. But uh, uh, I mean, honestly, I mean, who cares? You know, I mean. I don't think it alters yeah. the flavor that much because I've had hazy beer at some of these craft places that we go to eat. Uh, I, mean, I don't detect any flavor difference in the beer, you know. So uh, yeah, well, I think Brandon Brandon O, the guy who came up with this recipe, um, he actually made a, a point in the recipe there where he said that uh, if you're not worried about haze. Uh, you don't even have to bother cooling that one gallon boil. Just go ahead and dump it right in your cold apple juice, and it'll cool it right down. Uh, but it will cause it to be hazy because the heat will set the pectins in the in the apple juice. Um, yeah. So uh, he said, if you're worried about if you're worried about clarity, go ahead and cool that that boil down, and it won't take long to cool a one gallon boil in a sink of ice water. So I'll probably bring it down to, you know, 100 degrees or so and then go ahead and put it in and put my pectic enzyme in. That's not going to hurt anything. 
Well, you know what? I'm going to contact him. Uh, I'll see if I can contact him and uh, get his permission, and we'll throw this recipe up on our website. I mean, it looks really good. Uh, I don't really see mm-hmm. anything wrong with it. And plenty of people are – I'm on the website right now at Home Boot Talk, and there's a hundred and – well, let's see. How many threads are there? It's like a hundred and something pages of – a hundred. Actually, there's three hundred and nine pages. Okay, of this one thread. <laughs> so, yeah. so it yeah. you know, and, and I, you know, and here I'm thinking I came up with something new. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can imagine but, my surprise when I. When I yeah, but here's that. here's the other thing too. I mean, you know, that I've discovered on some of these forums is you know somebody will put up a recipe. It's you know, and, and they've had they've they've tested it, they've done it numerous times, they've perfected it, and you know, and it works. And then, you know, the next hundred pages after that are people who do the recipe but change this, change that, and then start asking questions. How come my how come my, it didn't turn out this way, or I'm getting these off flavors here, or you know, uh, yeah. And uh, but certainly, I mean, if it's a if it's a proven recipe, if it works, don't change it unless you know what you're doing, or you're not afraid of the result if it doesn't turn out, uh, you know, the way you expect it. I mean, it's not going to be the guy's fault that wrote the recipe to begin with; it'll be your own fault. So, but I think uh, I did a soapbox episode on that, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you did. And we're about due for another soapbox too, by God. Oh, I got plenty of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ryan, uh, you had uh, you got an inter- interesting uh, way of creating wort. <laughs> now, is well, this something it, accidental or or uh, how, how did this uh, turn out here? What, tell us about this thing. Yeah, so so I'll call this one a happy accident. Um. And what happened is I've mentioned in the past a couple of things. I've said that, uh, and Jeff kind of teased it earlier, that, you know, one of the one of the strategies that I like doing in extracting flavor from specialty grains um, is to cold steep them. So I've got a big, wide mouth, one, well, it's almost a two-gallon glass jar, and I'll take a grain bag and I'll throw specialty grains in that and fill the jar up and and let it steep. And then I usually let it steep for 24 hours and and I'm left with this infused um, uh, water of of the specialty grain. You know, you've done that with dark malts and you can pull out coffee notes or chocolate notes or toffee notes, whatever whatever um, character exists in this specialty malt as well as reducing the bitterness or astringency that would come when you would expose it to heat. Um, I typically do this for 24 hours. Uh, now what I also do and I've mentioned before is kind of if you know if, if we were each to pick kind of a what is your mead specialty? What is your corner of mead that that you guys like? You know, we we might find that Chris likes his big, bold, sweet flavored, you know, higher gravity, you know, meads um, and things like that. You know, and, and and Jeff and you know, I know JD, you might be still be searching for yours and that kind of thing. Uh, for me, I like dry session strength meads, so they're you know. Seven percent ish, you know, and and dry and and uh, you know I can have a pint of it, you know I can I can pour a beer glass worth of it and and uh, you know and and drink it the way I drink a beer or something. Mm-hmm. Um, well, when you ferment a mead, from what I've found, when I ferment a mead totally dry. Uh, that honey flavor and that honey aroma is pretty much gone and you've got to wait, you know, a month, six months, whatever for it to come back for that honey aroma, that honey flavor to come back, you know, into the meat, which, which is pretty amazing on how honey does that. Well, here was the experiment that I tried 
there is a malt out there uh, called a honey malt. It's by a, a Canadian malting company, and and I I don't have their name in front of me. It's one of those, um, you know, if you were to just go Google honey malt or go to a homebrew shop and type in honey malt, you know, it'd pop up. It's nothing that's hard to find. But one of the flavor profiles in this is it can taste like honey. It can add a, a little bit of a honey flavor. So my experiment was, okay, I'm going to steep this this honey malt, and then I'm going to add my honey to it, ferment it dry, and see if that honey malt lends a little bit of flavor to it that I can drink it a little faster and still have a little bit of honey flavor um, or a little more honey flavor to it than than you would get if you didn't have that. Um, now, you know, any of the brewers out there, you'll know that typically you've got to you've got to have a malt that that has not been roasted completely and still has some some active starches in it or enzymes in it. And you've got to uh, then that heat you know, activates, um, you know, starts kicking in. And, and like if you're an all grain brewer, you know, you need to get the heat just you know, to the to the right temperature and that activates yeah. the enzymes and they start converting the starches to sugars. And now you've got your mash. Well, like I said, when I steep these specialty grains for 24 hours, they really provide no fermentable sugars because there's there's no enzyme activation going on. Uh, so so anyway, that that's all the background. That's all the backstory. That's that's my uh, little, little bit on that. So I, you know, last week um, did that. I got I got a uh, some honey malt, put it in a grain bag, threw it in my. Um, in my jug, filled it up with water and set it aside. Um, you know, it had a top on it. And I've got kids, I, you know, busy, life sets in. And I didn't sure. let it steep for 24 hours. I let it steep for seven days. <laughs> and I and I came back and I go, oh, man, I gotta, I better look at this. And like big I, oops. <laughs> yeah, oops. I, uh, I opened it up and I just get hit with this um nutty honey aroma so there is it, it, it unlike you know now i haven't had any honeys you know maybe uh maybe somebody a honey expert could could tell me a honey that does have some nuttiness to it but this was like a nutty honey aroma and, and it was great and the color was beautiful like a dark amber and you know and it looked looked great um and and I said, you know, I'm curious as to what the gravity is on this, just to see what happened. And I checked it, and the gravity was 1020, meaning that, <laughs> meaning that the yeah, the these enzymes had started converting starches to sugars. And and then in our email chain, Jeff said, hey, you know, why don't you plug that into a brewer's calculator and and see what you would have expected from it. Um, you know, if you had heated it and it was within five points of what the brewer calculator said you'd get if you heated it. So basically you got full efficiency out of just steeping it for about a week, um, which, you know, I, I, I mentioned also to you guys would be you could essentially create a no heat beer or a no heat braggot by sure. now if you pitched your yeast and then if you were to uh dry hop it you know and, and you had essentially absolutely no no heat involved now i know what some of our listeners are thinking and i'll just call it out and i'll say yes of course that you know the the malt probably had something dust or or something on it and unless you were to boil that liquid you would not have a purely sanitary, you know, uh, wort right. to start with. I'm just talking about technically what would be possible, not what is the best practice if you want to do uh, if you want to do it that way. Yeah. But um, so anyway, uh, just middle of my experiment, I um, I took this 
this uh, honey malt wort, essentially, uh, one gallon of it, added a pound and a half of wildflower honey, uh, brought it up to about 1077, uh, wow. pitched, uh, yeah. pitched some, uh, I think it was, um, what did I have? It was a wine yeast. I want to say it was the uh, 1122 um, because, again, I, I wasn't treating it like a beer, so I didn't have much beer yeast on hand. I was treating it more like a, a more, more like I would a traditional mead. So and it and it was I, I hydrated the yeast and rehydrated the yeast and then I pitched it. And I'm not kid. I'm not I'm not exaggerating, you guys. It's within within. 15 30 minutes i was seeing bubbles and and it's it took off like a rocket um just this uh you know the fermentation um and it's i'm excited to see what happens you know how how dry it runs my other variable will be um if any of that original 1020 was was unfermentable sugars if if there had something had happened there, um, but then I'll I'll report back as well and see if uh, if this at at a very young age and dry still brings you some um, some honey aroma and a little honey flavor from that from that what, malt. Uh, I mean, how much grain to water ratio are we looking at? I mean, how much how much grain did you use and well, how much water did you use? Well, here's where Chris and I, uh, you know, become kindred spirits is I, uh, in a, in a one, you know, to make one gallon of liquid, I, I used one pound of honey malt, which, which is a lot. Yeah. To make one, one pound of honey, that's not a whole lot though, is it? Well, one, well, you know, you know, okay. if that if that works out for you, um, if you're going to make a high gravity mead and use that, then you wouldn't have to worry about the sanitation issue. But for doing what you're doing, you always have the option of treating it like fresh juice and sulfiding it. That, uh, that's if a you great, were really, yeah, you know, if if you're really that worried about it, you could you could brew it up and then sulfide it and. Uh, problem solved no that and that's a good that's a good point you can always do that um exactly no jd uh you know if when you're when you're making beers um i I, you know i this is considered this this honey malt would be considered a specialty grain um and so you know one pound of specialty grain in a one gallon batch would be um you know off the charts all right. Okay. Yeah, because well, I've seen some recipes where a five-gallon batch only had one pound of specialty grains, or a quarter pound. Yeah, yeah some so, of the uh, kits that I get, uh, yeah, it's like half a pound of this and a quarter pound of that uh, specialty grains. Uh, yeah. In in the kits that I do, so uh, interesting. I. I um, well, I mean, uh, when do you suspect this uh, little project is going to be completed? Do you think? I'm going to check it. Uh, I'm almost, I'm almost treating it like, uh, like a one month kind of mead. I want to do a test, like a, a test in, like that. So in the next couple weeks, um, did you taste it? Did you, did you taste the wort before you pitched or? You know, I, I tasted it just just a little bit. I mean, I use like an eye drop. I have a you know my refractometer. Um, you know, you only use basically an eye dropper just to yeah. put um, you know three drops on on the uh, lens. And you know, I, I tasted just a couple of drops on the tip of my tongue, um, and it it did have a. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a grain here, so it did have kind of a grainy taste a little bit, but uh, but it was uh, you know a, kind of a sweetish a sweet grain. Yeah. Um, 
you know, on there. So it'll be interesting. Like I said, my, my plan is to, uh, to rack it, you know, here in a second, I, I am going to do a, a rack it over, um, uh, you know, rack it, put it in, uh, see how well it clears on its own and, and, um, you know, see, taste it along the way and see how, how it would be drinkable in the, in the same way that, um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, session or hydromels, you know, can be drinkable in in a matter of weeks. Yeah. Isn't there some sort of iodine test or something you can do, um, to check and see how much conversion you had? Um, yes, I think there is. It's uh, I, I, I've never looked into how it's done, but I've seen other homebrewers do it when they uh, they talk about measuring the efficiency of their setup. You uh, you insert or you um, inoculate with some iodine, and then you get a, a measure based on that of like how much was converted yeah. via via enzyme or something like that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I think you you take a, a few drops of your your wort and you put it on a, a, a like a white background plate or something and you put a couple of drops of iodine tincture there and if it remains red you don't have much conversion but if it turns black um then you have fermentable sugars present um that's how i understand it I, i'll have to look into it oh, interesting well i hope it works out uh Keep tabs on it for us and let us know how it turns out and everything. And and I will clarify yeah. that uh, even even though Jeff originally would have called this a a methaglen, Michael Fairbrother would would classify it as a braggot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. Uh, Only about five hundred more times on that joke, Jeff. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, well, and it's, here we are blurring the lines between styles, and I, yeah, I see his point that it is a grain, and even if you're not getting uh, fermentables from the grain, well, yeah, no, we're okay. Yeah, but I'll, yeah, I'll you know you. what, Jeff, you said something. You one one of your one of your comebacks on the email, one of your replies, uh, and I, and I took note of it mentally. There's a word in there that really stands out to uh, to this whole thing that we do. Fringe. Yep. I mean, this is such a boundaryless thing we're doing. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, we're, we're only limited to that by what is available out there to consume. I mean, for crying out loud, I've, you know, I've seen people make, make beers with Freaking chocolate cakes and carrots and you name it. Yeah. I mean, I've I've had mead yeah. that was flavored with the actual the fruit of the cashew tree. Um, the <laughs> you know most of most of the Western world it forgets even exists and like discards as as a uh, uh, as junk. Um, yeah. We live in a world that is incredibly connected and incredibly like. If I wanted to make a mead like that, I'm pretty sure with a little bit of effort, I could run down a source in South America or Africa, and uh, and get myself a, a few bushels of cashew apples to make a mead with. Uh, it would take time, it would take money, but it's technically possible. And that's yeah. that's the funny thing about mead is that you know even less extreme stuff um, than than those examples. We're we're still figuring stuff out, and it's. The the uh, the outer fringes of the mead world um, have not been explored the same way that we've we've had the time to explore craft beer or, or wine, and um, that's what makes this an exciting hobby is that we're figuring stuff out as yeah. we go. And now yeah. we just have to start keeping an eye out for the observers. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, look up the TV series Fringe, and you'll <laughs> yep. I, I love that show. <laughs> you remember remember the observers? Yeah, I love that show, yeah. dude. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, Jeff, to your point of uh, you know, and, and joking about to call it, there's a brewery uh, not far from me that is a gluten free brewery, and they say huh. we have we make gluten free beer. Well. 
they use sorghum instead yeah. of you know malt. And I wow. and I'm think you know so you say to yourself, well, they call it a beer, but I mean, is it is it really a beer? It's I mean it's sorghum. It's it's not barley. I get, uh, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, no, you know, no, no, no. There's nothing wrong with it at all. I'm, I'm just, you know, when I, when I joke and, and we're all friends here, so that's why I just, I rib them once in a while on that, and I'm sure. Well, they'll the, find the of it beyond. when we were on the ranch, okay, when we were fattening up the, the last few months, uh, actually, probably maybe like the last, yeah, about the last few months. Uh, fattening up the steers, they went on what we called a sweet feed, and it was grain, corn, and oats and whatnot, and it was sweetened with sorghum. And yeah. you know, my my trips into the grain bin uh, would always include a handful and throw in my own mouth <laughs> and chew on it. You know. Yep. Well, I mean, so it was if just, you've no, ever I mean, if you've ever worked on a farm or a ranch and you haven't had a mouthful of sweet feed. Yeah. Then you weren't you weren't working very hard. That's it. So. And you just put it in there and chew on it while you know, while I was got there and feed the cows and, and do the chores and chewing on some chaw. Uh and if you ever if you want to see something really funny, uh wait until you have a steer that has a bad stomach and he eats sweet feed and it ferments and gets him drunk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you've I've never seen a drunk too. steer, oh yeah! If you've never seen yeah. a drunk steer, uh, yeah. you haven't lived. Yeah, uh, yeah you got to be than careful. Any comedy act. Yeah, it's better than any comedy act you could ever go see. Yeah, I don't remember. I mean, I I, I didn't measure by pounds. It was a level in a bucket that I used, and uh, yeah, you had to be careful. You just couldn't throw a crap load of sweet feet out there for. You know, you had to be careful how much you're feeding them, but uh, you know that's what we used at the end to, uh, you know, put a nice layer of back fat and and uh, and everything on the beef when we uh, just before we killed. So, but uh, yeah, sorghum. Why not use sorghum? Well, and actually, an interesting statistic I heard over this weekend: sorghum is actually the source, of the the number one source of fermentable sugars in alcohol products worldwide. Um, a lot of communities in, in Africa will do uh, essentially like a, a cottage alcohol production where, you know, a few people in, in the, the, the towns or the villages will produce for, for everybody in the village. Um, a lot of Chinese villages have a, uh, a drink called Baiju that is, is mainly made with sorghum, as I understand it. There's just yeah. a lot of uh, it. Sorghum grows uh, pretty diversely. It's a pretty hardy plant and it has yep. a pretty good amount of sugar to it. So, why not? Yeah. Um, yeah, it it is, it, and it's it's not something you think about, but it it is the the most commonly used fermented sugar uh, on the planet. Yeah, mm-hmm. and yeah. despite all that, I have still not been able to to find a way to use it in a mead and have have a good product. And I know there's a, there's a way to do it. There's got to be some way, um, but I have failed in all my attempts so far. So, I think uh, there's a recipe for it on uh, Denard Brewing. For sorghum based meat? I think there is a. Uh, I it can't think, be using pure sorghum. It's got to be mixing it with other think, stuff, I'm sure. I think it's a honey I'm sorghum a, syrup uh, recipe. Yeah. yeah, I think he referred to it as a sorghum. <laughs> yeah, there or you something go. Something like that. Yeah. Well, uh, that's a. Sorghum syrup, I and mean, that's going to be a, not well. It's not going to taste like molasses, but it's going to be kind of like a molasses. Uh, it's going to be it's pretty pretty rich stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorghum sorghum syrup mead. I mean, if that's he's a... buying if he's buying sorghum syrup from like a feed store or something like that, where it's you know more commonly. You know, where you can get it most commonly, uh, it's it's really thick and and he's. You know, I I remember when when Bray was uh, was actually formulating that recipe over on the Got Mead forums, and he asked um, people's opinion on it, and I had told him on that thread 
uh, I commented and said that I had not had good luck with it, and I told him how much I had used. And I think what he came up with was the idea that uh, it was good in smaller amounts. Yeah, his so, his recipe calls for uh, 10 ounces of sorghum syrup per two and a half pounds of honey. Yeah. Yeah, I think he figured out that the secret to it was to dial back the sorghum um, quite a bit and keep the amount below. Uh, I believe he, uh, at that time, I think he might have said like 7% or something of the fermentable. Um but he may have altered that since then. I don't know. Well, but yeah, if you keep keep the amount low, and you can probably probably do it. Well, I mean, you know, here we are talking about you know using sorghum in a mead. So I mean, that fringe stuff is out there. The fringe. What was that old man's name? That was a father and son. That that old man. That old scientist. Uh, oh. Um, God, I love that show. That's such a great uh, show. Walter. Anyway, Walter, yeah. Walter. Walter. Yeah. Oh, Walter. <laughs> yeah, and he never yeah. could get the other girl's name right. Yeah. He called her something different every time. Every if time, you, yeah. you need to go back. If you've never seen that, go go on Netflix or somewhere and look up Fringe, and watch, you'll, you'll watch the whole entire, uh, all, every yeah. season of it in order. Yeah, uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but if you do decide to watch it, make sure you pay attention and don't skip any episodes because when you get toward the end, the stuff that happened way back at the beginning is very important. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Yeah, that was a good show. I love that show. Uh, anybody uh, besides our Braggot projects? Anybody got anything on a on a bucket list or a hopper list or? Well, now the, that uh, I heard you know? uh, now that I heard Ryan's uh, description of what he likes, and I already know what uh, what Jeff likes, and I think Aaron may be right in there with him. So, I guess I'm going to have to try and create a uh, a session mead that will that they can uh, enjoy. So I'm thinking about taking my base recipe for my uh, sourwood traditional and, and working it into a session strength. Yeah. You know, we were chatting after the show last week and uh, I am, I've got to get some fermenter space open. So that's the only reason I haven't kicked this one off yet, but um, I'm going to start a, a piment. And it's going to be a blend of uh, Zin- red Zinfandel juice, um, Pinot Noir juice, and then uh, mesquite honey. And and I'm going to do that, and then I'm probably going to, you know, after it ferments all the way down, I'm, prob- I'm going to let it sit on, on some oak. Uh, and and do that but that that's the next one that i've got going here and and part of the reason you know is i I think i told you guys that when i when i got into the hobby and and uh you know cider beer mead you know wine anything else and my wife you know kind of let me embrace it was i said honey this is going to reduce the amount of uh, beer and wine that we buy at the liquor store. <laughs> and and to date, it has not. That, I was going to say, and, all, and, you, all you people out there listening to the Mead House here, I hope you guys are taking notes on how to get stuff past your wife. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I and guess. For, and for all the ladies listening, I'm sorry, but we don't have any advice for you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I I'm, wish uh, we did. <laughs> I'm gonna make some stuff that uh, is a lot closer to the stuff that we usually buy, and see if we can if we can find a suitable clone, so to speak. I like the idea of using grape juice. That's the that's my next 
that's my next thing. I, I, I love a good wine. I like I like good red wines. And I like a variety. My preference is, are the, is the drier side of the wines. I mean, I, I like Zinfandels. I like Cabernets. I like Merlots. Uh, and I like good, deep red, heavily oaked red blends, table wines, too. Uh, but that would be my next, uh, you know, uh, my next deal w- with the meads. I'm, I'm still. I, I think I found my my preference in meads, and I think it's going to be the Braggett thing. Um, but I, I'm willing to give this uh, Ryan this grape juice thing a, a whirl too. Uh, that just the whole thing sounds good to me. Uh, Jeff, you got anything uh, in the hopper at all, or still working well, on stuff? <laughs> I've got all kinds of stuff uh, in in <laughs> primary at the moment. I've got, I think I've got like eight or nine gallons of uh, random stuff in one gallon fermenters or uh, little buckets. Um, I took uh, I took Chris at his suggestion over the weekend and went out to Home Depot and got uh, a couple more little two gallon food grade buckets to start making some stuff because. Uh, I've All still bad. got fruit in the yeah I've still got fruit in the freezer from like late spring and into summer that uh, meant to go make methylens with and never really got around to because it was so hot and I've been kind of like getting sidetracked with that uh, that refrigerator project yeah. so um, you know and on top of that I've also got like sizers and ciders and big batches so. I'm I'm running at a fair clip with all my fermenters these days after a pretty slow summer. <laughs> I have. Um... I was thinking about that blueberry sizer thing, Chris, and uh, so I went out, I bought a couple of gallons of apple juice, and I had one pound of blueberries in the freezer, and I bought another three-pound bag, uh, and uh, I, I just started putting stuff in a bucket, and I put the blueberries in, mashed them all up. Threw some pectic enzyme in, dumped the apple juice in, put one can of apple juice concentrate in on top of that. I added uh, enough honey. And I I can't get up from my desk here to go get my book, but I think I, I think I come up to a, to a 120 on the hydrometer after I put the honey in wildflower because I just picked up a, another 60 pound bucket of honey. Uh, and uh, I used, I, let's see, what yeast did I use? A 71B. I just threw some 71B in it, um, mm-hmm. you know, with some go firm and everything. And uh, so that's, it's, you know, probably maybe a two and a half gallon, not quite a three gallon uh, deal. Yeah. Uh, just so, don't, uh, don't do the lees aging part with that 71B. And you're, no. you're probably going to end up, if you started at 120, you're probably going to want to sweeten that up a little bit. Uh, once it's finished, uh, well, we'll see. Uh, we'll see where it winds up, uh, and uh, yeah, if I need to, uh, you know, maybe throw some some more honey into it. You know what I might even do is add some apple concentrate uh, in. I don't sorbated. think you'll need. I don't. You may want to stay away from that because you've already yeah. added uh, the apple concentrate. And see, here, this is the problem, like with the graph. Uh, you've got all this vitamin C that's added in the apple juice and in the concentrate. Yeah. So, and then you're going to get some astringency, and you're going to get some some sharpness from the from, from the, the blueberries, blueberries as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, but that that works well in that particular mead because uh, if you finish in a gravity of like ten twenty something. Uh, it's almost perfect to balance with the with that sharpness that that comes in there. So yeah, um, I, I think uh, I think we're looking at like something. Uh, I mean, you do the math. It was something like uh, ten sixteen or something like that is where I kind of figured it might wind up. If it hits yeah, there, you'll probably I think need it'll to sweeten okay. that up a little bit. Yeah, well, yeah, you yeah, you're going to need it probably in the ten twenty something range. Uh, uh, I think I. Put in the recipe. Start at eleven thirty, which uh, with D forty seven, that would put you down around you know ten twenty twenty ten twenty two or something like that. Yeah, um, that's that's usually about where they end up, and they're they're pretty good there. 
uh, and they actually don't come across as being sweet because of all the the tartness that's in there with it. So, yeah, um, you know, I've got that going, and uh, I've got these beers that are about to start uh, to try to create another braggot, and I've got um, oh, let's see what else? Oh, uh, an update: the the chocolate orange finally oh, yeah. cleared. Yeah. Uh, it no longer looks like Guatemalan goat vomit, uh, <laughs> but it it still it still got this color to it. Um, it's almost a mahogany color, and uh, it's one of the weirdest looking meads. It, and it, it, if you look at it in the light, it has uh, almost a trans. Not translucent, but uh, almost a neon look to it. So it's, <laughs> oh, it, yeah. it's pretty weird looking stuff, but uh, my gosh, is it good! <laughs> <laughs> wow! And uh, you're gonna call it what? Goat vomit? I don't know yet. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what we're gonna Goat call it yet. Well, <laughs> well, it's it's kind of a vitamin well, T orange. <laughs> I think we. Oh, <laughs> That's funny. So we'll see. I'll I'll have to send you guys a bottle of it. <laughs> I yeah. gotta get rid of it so, somehow. Yeah, what you need to do is put a picture of a goat puking on the label, and uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Well, guys, uh, that's uh, probably going to wrap it up for the show here tonight. Uh, another Tuesday here at the Mead House. Uh, sounds like we all got plenty of stuff going on. Like I needed more uh, to add to my 30 gallons of stuff in the uh, in the Mead House here. But uh, fun show tonight. Uh, next Tuesday is... Uh, November 8th, so uh, be sure to get out and vote for whomever you think you need to vote for. Uh, we'll be here on the air uh, keeping an eye on things, and uh, I'm sure we'll come up with some more recipes, uh, more to talk about between now and then. I want to throw a shout out to old Scott Monroe. I know you're hanging out there, bud. I see you. Uh, what do you say we all come back to the table next Tuesday night about 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time? We'll do this all over again. So uh, we'll see you then. <laughs> <laughs>